went to Penn State University to teach, we used to joke about ghosts. We were always told that shortly after Andrew Carnegie gave to the university the money to build Carnegie Building, the ghosts invaded it. And if you sat very quietly in my office on any given night, you could hear the ghosts running around the Carters. Yes, I don't know if they're still there or not, but you go back, you listen, who knows what you're going to hear. Carnegie had already been giving money nationwide for libraries. Carnegie agreed that he would fund about $100,000 as an outright grant for a library building. He actually got to oversee the architect's proposal and he wanted very specific things in his building. Uh, the Carnegie libraries had um, very traditional materials that they used in the buildings. They all look alike. If you, if you go around the country and look at Carnegie libraries, they have the same kind of look and feel. Um, it's similar to what we would know now as big box stores, things like Target and Walmart. President Appleton, General Beaver, ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, students of State College. It is 20 years since I was here, and I feel like Rip Van Winkle after he had slept 20 years. This is a great evolution. This high school for farmers, I find has now 19 courses, embracing all subjects of human knowledge. 20 years ago, I found 170 students here, now I find between 700 and 800. And the cry is, still they come. Um, within a year of the Carnegie Library open, opening, um, rooms on the second floor were used for classes and offices and for administrative purposes. The first floor was a rather big open space which was study carols and tables. And that was used pretty um, extensively till about the 1940s. Eventually, when the library had outgrown Carnegie and they planned to build what became Petit Library, they moved to Petit Library in 1939, which made the Carnegie Building have the opportunity to do other things. At one point, even the fire company was housed in the Carnegie Building. Um, the, the pumper and hose cart were in the back of the building. Uh, one of the things that was moved into the Carnegie Building in the 1940s was the Daily Collegian. Pardon me, boys, that's the Chattanooga choo-choo. Track 29, boy, you can give me a shine. I can't afford to board a Chattanooga choo-choo. I've got my fare and just a trifle to spare. You leave the Pennsylvania Station by the quarter to four. Read the uh, this campus had about uh, 17, 18,000 students, but a great many of them were servicemen and women. It was a very uh, um, exciting, but also a very serious time on this campus. When I first got here, the Daily Collegian at that time was a weekly, cut back to a weekly because of uh, World War II. We met in 1951. Oh, we had uh, a class, classes at Carnegie in journalism, and then uh, we were married in 1954. We were seated alphabetically, my maiden name being Agnew and George being Allberger. And he would come into class sometimes late and want to borrow my notes because he wasn't there on time. And I thought, why can't this older student show up on time like everybody else? I don't know how I could have been an old man at 24 years old, but that's about how the age I was at that time. But Betty also pulled a trick in class, which I mm -hmm. fell for, and 
dropped one of her hairpins. She sat in front of me, and I reached over and picked it up and handed it to her and asked her if it was hers and asked her for a date. And what I didn't know was that... I was washing dishes at the infirmary. I was a pots and pans man, actually, and uh, <clears throat> they would be there a lot longer when the infirmary was full of sick people. That's the reason I'd be late. I'd be late, and I thought, aha, somebody who washes dishes, that can't be all bad. So. <laughs> and I've been so doing we... it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> When the newsroom was located in the central part of the first floor of Carnegie, the newspaper's copy editors would occasionally conduct impromptu late-night chair races after the paper was put to bed. The chief obstacle in the races were the huge aluminum ashtrays bolted to the walls of the hallway. The winner, whoever was left standing, or rolling as it were. I had Gene Goodwin for news editing class. Um, he threatened to knock on our doors and drag us out of our beds if we dared sleep in on lab day. I came here in 1957 as director of the School of Journalism and professor of journalism off the Washington Star where I'd been a reporter and a columnist and sometimes desk editor. The School of Journalism occupied a corner of the first floor only. We shared type, 17 typewriters, 17 exactly, I know because I screwed them on the desk myself on Saturday before classes opened on Monday. Downstairs we had the Daily Collegian which had about half the first floor. The other half was the Army ROTC, believe it or not. Talk about incompatible units. The rest of the building was music department. It was Friday afternoon, November 22nd, 1963, and I just finished my last class in Carnegie before the weekend. The only thing I had on my mind was the upcoming weekend trip to Pittsburgh in the Pitt-Penn State game when the teletype began to click. Yes, we had teletype back then. President John F. Kennedy had been shot in Dallas and feared dead, the message said. Horrified, I left the classroom heading downstairs when I met a fellow journalism student coming up and told him the news. He didn't believe me. The Penn State campus went into mourning. The game and other weekend activities were canceled. Penn Staters and the rest of the nation sat glued to the TV news for the next several days, saddened by what we were seeing and dreading what the future would hold. What it held for many was a trip to Vietnam. It's a very tough time for us. The students were, were beginning to pick at classes and after the Kent State uh, assassination, I call it, after that shooting by the National Guard's people. I think we're very tough here. We actually closed three weeks early because the students were in turmoil and that would have been, what year was that, 69, 69, 70? The first required journalism course was a doozy, Journalism 213. It was a weeder course, shaking out those who weren't really cut out for journalism because the major was so popular. After all the president's men came out, everyone and his grandmother wanted to be a journalist. We met in a big classroom on the second floor in the very front of Carnegie. There was a big window facing in front of the building just outside the classroom. It had a ledge against it. The joke was that Journalism 213 students often wanted to jump out that window after class to put themselves out of their misery. I attended my job interview in Bob Richards' office in January of 2002. It was the first time I had set foot in Carnegie in 12 years. The renovation was amazingly well done and the building still had that fabulous feeling. I remember walking out of Carnegie onto the mall with a gorgeous light snow falling and thinking, I'm back where I started. As an ad major and collegiate staffer, I guess I spent about 30 or 40 hours a week in Carnegie. I didn't pull open the big black front doors that much because we collegiate staff preferred to use the collegiate entrance on the Pollock Roadside, where the collegiate historical marker now points the way to the sealed door to the film video equipment room. When the college communications started in uh, 1986, we were just a small fraction of the size that we are now. Carnegie's library slash collegian office has disappeared. In its place is the Carnegie Cinema, which is an auditorium that gets heavy use all year. And it looks so unlike what used to be there that nobody even hears the ghostly ding, ding, ding of the wire machine hanging in the air anymore. 
Well, John is special. And uh, he, he, was, uh, he came from the right part of the world, the Middle West. All good people come from the Middle West. You've got to get used to that fact. Um, and he, uh, he, uh, he was an interesting young man right from the beginning. The old Carnegie building was pretty badly run down. Uh, and it was not very efficient use of uh, space. The uh, paint was peeling off the wall, and uh, uh, there weren't any screens on the window. There was no uh, air conditioning. Uh, and as a result of that, we'd have to open our windows during the summer, and no screens, and the squirrels would invade us and steal our lunches and uh, run, around the hall, run around the hallways. Um, so it was, it was pretty run down and pretty rough shape, but it had some real character to it. The old building was tastefully tacky. The basement is where I stayed, and the, the film majors just stay down there, that's their home. This is my first time back in this building since I graduated, and I walked into the basement and I could smell that smell. And I, you know, I just knew that I was, I was back in Carnegie, and I, I used to sleep in this building all the time. I slept better here than I did at home sometimes. I mean, it was, this was my home. Carnegie had seen its day, particularly the lobby, and some of the other portions of the building. And um, it was time to uh, give it a, uh, a, a uh, restoration and a renovation. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful entrance to the college. And uh, the first thing you see when you walk in the door of Carnegie Building, the old Carnegie Library, is the First Amendment of the Constitution uh, on the wall. It's our mission statement, our organizing statement. and. Uh, so it's a very welcoming uh, experience when you enter a Carnegie building these days. As the program here grows in importance, it's only right that the building uh, where it is housed should grow in, uh, in its appeal and its attractiveness. Well, President Jordan had a great idea of taking all the scattered components of communication uh, around the university and bringing them together under, uh, under one roof. Well, in the same way that the past um, is mostly about the people and not so much about the structure. Um, the, uh, the future of the Carnegie Building, I think, is going to be uh, is going to be even better. Um, yes, they'll be remodeling. Uh, uh, yes, the physical structure will change in in, in uh, certain ways, but uh, the future of Carnegie Building is like the past. It's the people. General Beaver, I hand you this key. Take it, sir, from one who loves Pennsylvania, who loves State College, who loves the people of the United States, and who will serve them as well. Thank you.